Good morning. Talked about baptism a little bit last week. In that, Jesus' baptism seems superfluous and yet for a reason. And our emphasis last Sunday was about identifying with Jesus, if you will remember. And we are having baptisms next Sunday. So June 24th is next Sunday. So we wanted to um, talk about baptism a little more because there's not just identifying with Jesus in it. Um, there's other stuff too. So we're going to talk about it. Um, Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist why is he called John the Baptist? He's John the Dunker. He's John the Immerser. Um, that word baptizo in the New Testament is Greek and means to be whelmed or overwhelmed. That word, um, my understanding is it was also used in dyeing cloth because you dunk the cloth in the dye and when it comes out, it's changed. It's got dye in it, and it, you can't get the dye back out of it. It's done. It's been whelmed. You know, you've ever been overwhelmed or underwhelmed? But that flooding of things. And it, through years of tradition and humans and man and you know, one of the criticisms of the church by the world is that we're inconsistent, and they're right. Uh, you know, the John, or the um, King James translators, when they were translating the scriptures they had into English, uh, for the first time approved by the king. But that's another story. They use the word baptize instead of immerse because already there was a tradition of baptism of infants in a baptismal font with sprinkling or what have you. In other words, we'd already kind of wandered away from the simple truth to the point that they are like, oh, we're going we're gonna to hack the king off. We, won't, we don't want to alienate the king and the, the established church, so we'll, we'll just kind of make up a word. We'll use that Greek word and call it baptize because now it means whatever we want it to mean and how we do it, rather than using the simple term immerse or dunk, as Landon would like to say. So John the baptizer was dunking people. He was whelming people. He was covering people over with water. And there's several references in the New Testament for why did they baptize at this particular place? Because there was plenty of water there. Um, it was a practice that was actually started before John the Baptist. He wasn't the originator of this. Historically, the Jews, if a person became a Jew, if a person was a Gentile and said, oh, this God that you worship is the true God, I believe I will, I want to worship him with you, I'll become a Jew, that baptism or Im ritual cleansing of immersion and raising up was something that was already being done when Gentiles became Jews. And so it was not a completely new thing or a strange thing to the people when John says, this generation is horrible, we've got to change, and we'll symbolize it by baptism, by immersion. And so it says in um, Luke that all kinds of people came to be baptized, to be immersed, not just Pharisees and scribes, but regular people. It says the tax collectors came and soldiers came. And of course, Roman soldiers, they weren't Jews. They weren't even locals. These guys were from all over the Roman world brought here to occupy this unruly, rebellious province of Rome. So John is out there doing his thing. And I love his preaching because, or actually I don't love it, but I find his preaching interesting because 
the sermon that we have recorded in John chapter 3, or rather in Matthew chapter 3, uh, John opens his sermon with, you guys are a bunch of snakes. In uh, Matthew 3 verse 7, who warned you about the wrath of God that's coming? Bear fruit in your life in keeping with repentance. And in verse 11, he says, I baptized with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff will be burned with unquenchable fire. So this is a hellfire kind of thing, saying you guys need to repent. You need, you've got to turn to God because the time is short. And in that context, Jesus appears, and he says in verse 13 here, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately as he came up out of the water, behold, the heavens were torn open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So if this was the only example of baptism in the New Testament, I think in a way we probably wouldn't baptize because, you know, when Jesus got baptized and this amazing thing happened, you know, time-space continuum is rent and, and God comes down bodily that, wow, that was so special, that was so amazing, you know, we shouldn't just do that, right? Because Jesus is special. But Jesus says, no, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness. And God says he is the beloved. And we talked about this last week, the temptation of Jesus after, where what is the devil's challenge to him? Did God really say, if you are the son of God, then do something stupendous, do something powerful, turn stones into bread, leap off a tall building and don't get hurt. Do that and that will prove to me that you're the son of God. But see, Jesus rested on his true identity which was that he was the beloved of God. God, for his sake and for ours, tore open heaven, made a physical presence, and said in the hearing of everyone, this is my beloved. This is my beloved. So Jesus, when the devil says, well, if you're for real, you should do this other thing, Jesus can say, no, I'm just going to remind you of that God himself has told me that I am his beloved. This is why we should be baptized, to identify with this person who is the beloved of God who says, come. You know, Jesus, we, we want to make it so hard that Jesus has asked us to do so many hard things of, of rule following and works, but really what Jesus says is, is come. Come, and walk with me. Now, in the, at the end of Matthew, when Jesus... So I'm saying I, I want to identify with Jesus just because of that. Just because of how he dealt with the devil and temptation. But Jesus goes on at the end of his earthly ministry in Matthew 28. We've all heard this where he says, what does he say to his disciples? One of the last things he says is, it sounds like a very commanding command, go. Shall we read it? Matthew 28, 19, or 18. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we see this example of Jesus coming 
and I want to identify with him. But then Jesus commands it. He says, no, you, you do this. Keep doing this for others. And I guess what I'm saying is I, I want there to be more. Um, like, what is, what is this about? What is this for? And let's recap. Last week we went to Romans chapter 6 to identify with Jesus, with who he is and what he did. And so Romans chapter 6, what shall we say? How can we do this? Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. And so now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus had victory over death, we can rise and have victory over death too. I think next week we're going to talk about the resurrection more. Because if we were just forgiven, that would be good enough, wouldn't it? I mean, Jesus' perfect sacrifice of dying was enough to allow us to be completely forgiven for all of our sin so he could have just stayed dead and, we, and he would have accomplished forgiveness. But yet he didn't just die a perfect sacrifice. He had victory over death. He broke the rules. He altered physics and time and space and became a living being again. So how are we then... Besides identifying with Christ, then what more are we going to do with baptism is what I'm saying. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12. Just as the, this is Paul talking about spiritual gifts and about being the church. For just as the body, the church, is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are also one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And then he talks about feet and hands and stuff. So I want to be identified with Jesus in his death, his resurrection, and his life. But I believe what Paul is also saying is that baptism is a unifying thing, an experience that we share, that we are all part of this one big family of Jesus. One more, Colossians chapter 2, I think we should read this whole chapter out loud, but, but I'm not going to, because context is awesome, because he's talking about being free of empty philosophies and extra rules because this is human nature, is that 
I want there to be a list so that I can say, see, I've done the list, A, B, C, D. I can feel confident that I'm in good standing with Jesus now because I have fulfilled these rules. And I feel like my theme for today has been just, but God says, but you're the beloved. You're my beloved. Just be my beloved. And I'm fighting God and saying, well, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do? I should do this and do that. And when I finally quiet those voices down, I feel like Jesus says, well, could you just be with me? Could you just be with me a little while? I don't really need you to do stuff for me. And in a way, it hurts my feelings. I want to do stuff. I'm good at doing stuff. It's like the, it's, but you know what? It's like anybody deal with small children when they're two or three and they say, ooh, ooh, look what I can do. And you say, oh, uh, sure. What, what, what is it you can, I can jump. <laughs> oh, that's nice. They want to show you what they can do, but you know that it's just, they're there. You're, just, you're silly. You're just a child, and, and you think it's cool. I, I get that. But you just don't have any idea of how huge the world is and how insignificant whatever it was you can do is. And I feel like that, that's, that's me. I'm saying, Lord, don't you want me to do stuff for you? And, and I feel like if I would just have a realistic perspective, it's more I'm like a toddler going, oh, let me show you what I can do, God. And he's like, mm-hmm, that's nice. Why don't, you just, why don't you just be with me? Could you just be with me? And <laughs> help us, Lord, to be content to just be with you and identify with you. Um, Josh Hellams was saying something earlier that I'm going to repeat, so I, I did borrow it from him. You know, that uh, fabric that gets dyed by being dunked in the dye, it doesn't really do anything. It just gets dunked. And it's, but it, then it's changed. And anybody ever... Um, I hope I'm not the only one. Anybody ever uh, washed something white with something red? And it, usually something that belongs to my wife that I wash with. How, many, how much of your stuff have I ruined over the years of our marriage? I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, once, once your underwear is pink, it ain't never going to be white again. I can just tell you that from experience. I have several pairs of pink underwear that um, they're never going to get white again. And you might as well just um, smile and learn from it. Um, that's, I don't know if I've learned anything. But once we have come into contact with Jesus' blood, we are changed. Don't let the devil say, now if... You are the son of God. If you are really beloved by him, then you need to do something powerful and something stupendous and something self-disciplined and something amazing. And I need to be like that weaned child with his mother who just knows that everything's good. And I pray that I will have the faith to, to walk in that. Colossians chapter 2. I went off. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. You know, so empty tr human tradition, that's, that's a human thing. But you know the elemental spirits he's talking about evil spirits and that we, he's saying don't don't let philosophy and empty deceit lead you away 
because those are from evil spirits. For in him, that is Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells in a body, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him on the cross. This is a mouthful of stuff, but it is so huge. He is talking to Gentiles, Gentiles who have never been Jews. They don't even understand what the Jews are all uptight about. The men have not been circumcised. He is talking about symbolism here, saying, don't be led astray by evil spirits that want to put all these burdensome rules upon you. Because in Jesus, you were made a perfect Jew without hand. You were circumcised. You were made a perfect law-abiding Jew by, by the actions of Christ. You were buried with him in baptism, raised with him. And look where it says, God made, alive, made us alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Okay, trespasses is an old-fashioned kind of word, but I like it. It's a picture. I crossed a border where I don't belong. Have you ever trespassed? on someone's property. I was once in England. I was on a plane with a bunch of other guys and we had to stop at, I think it was Lake and Heath. There's U2s there, not the band, not Bono. The old aircraft, you know they still fly U2s? So there's U2s there and we had a, some kind of mechanic problem and we pulled over and so C-130 on the ramp and we see, look, oh look, there's a shopette, which is the military AFI's word for, you know, 7-Eleven, for all those who weren't there. And a couple of us said, well, you know, we're kind of stuck here, we're broke down, we're waiting on aircraft, and uh, let's just, you know, we'll kind of skitter along the edge of the runway and go over there and get some, something to eat. Okay, seemed like a harmless idea. And, um, Unbeknownst to me, these uh, orange ropes that we were crossing were where the U-2 guys work. And um, out of nowhere, I mean, this is in the 90s. There wasn't like, I don't know, I don't think there were like cameras and stuff. But out of nowhere, a pickup truck full of um, Air Force security guys with M-16s who all looked like they were young enough to n not old enough to drive, uh, and they jacked us up. Which, in military speak, if you I, we were on the we were on the on our faces on the tarmac with our hands behind us, and they got all of our IDs, and and we were held guard by somebody, and they went away, and they came back anyway. Unbeknownst to me, we were trespassing. We crossed a line that they took very very seriously. And rather than be offended, they had every right to hold us and to even prosecute us had you know, we not had a good reason for being there and being ignorant isn't really a good reason. <laughs> what I'm saying is we have trespassed. We have crossed lines that we, where we didn't belong and broken rules even in our ignorance 
And the devil and these elemental spirits have a record of debt that stands against us with legal demands. This is, this is scary in a sense. What I'm saying is, is that none of us deserve to be here and none of us deserve anything good to happen to us because we've all crossed these lines and we've trespassed and the devil is like a lawyer who knows the law better than you and better than me. And the lawyer, who is the devil, says, by this law and this statute, this person deserves to die. And he's right. And sometimes I feel that and experience that, and I don't like it. Because, you know, what do, what do immature people want? They don't really want forgiveness. They want to be excused. Do you hear what I'm saying? Tell your brother you're sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, are you sorry? Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, tell him it's all right. Okay, it's all right. What did we just do? That was a transaction from my life, but it meant nothing. There was no forgiveness there. There was an excuse. Tell him nothing happened. Okay, nothing happened. All right, this is not what we're talking about. Forgiveness was when I say, I was wrong, I deserve punishment, and you say, I forgive you, I release you from my judgment, you deserve punishment. I agree you deserve punishment, but you will not receive it because I've released you into God's hands. That's what forgiveness is, and we don't do that very well, but I digress. The, the devil would like us to be punished to the fullest extent of the law, and we deserve it. This is why Jesus had to come. Look at verse 14. It's the best news in the universe. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this Jesus set aside Nailing it to the cross. See, who, what was nailed to the cross? Jesus. Jesus became my sin. He became my trespasses. He was nailed. And he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the, the cross. Jesus turned all the culture and all the rules on its head because... The cross was the ultimate in humiliation and the ultimate in failure of... So if Jesus was a revolutionary who was trying to change the world, change the Roman world, he failed utterly, yes? Do we agree? He was humiliated in the most demeaning way possible, devised by man. And yet, here's Paul who says, no, actually, he stripped the devil and all of the devil's angels of their powers, of their armaments, of their legal demands that they had on us and put them to open shame. So this thing that was shameful, he says now, no, this was, he took our shame and shamed the shamers instead. So I, I want to be baptized to be like Jesus in his baptism. I want to be baptized to identify with Christ the metaphor of burial and resurrection. But I also want to be baptized to identify with all the other believers who have been baptized because we're one. And that's a physical way to become one with others is to share experiences if you've ever been to basic training or camp or ranger school or something similar or EMT training, those people that you're in your class with, that you overcome with, those become your friends. That It's hard to shake those friends. Even other bad experiences you go through with. And I want us to have that with our fellow believers. I grew up in a denomination where uh, baptism was reduced to a part of the formula. Okay, there was 
the five steps to salvation. And that was hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And ta-da, you get the prize at the end for completing all the steps. And that if you're baptized, then you're saved. And that was the way it was taught to me. And that was, you notice, I can still, I can still say it. Um, and it's, here's the thing, is it's not all wrong. It's just incomplete. Because did Jesus heal every blind man the same way? I can't think, I don't know exactly how many blind men get healed in the New Testament, but there's several, and he kind of does it different every time. There's one where he spits, and there's one where he takes the guy out of town, and there's one where the guy gets partially healed and says, wow, I still, I see things, but it's like trees walking around, and Jesus prays again, and there's other times where he just says a word, and people get healed. So why does he do it that way? It seems so inconsistent. I think it's because he doesn't want us to turn it into a magic formula. Acts 10, um, the household of Cornelius. So Peter was a Jew, and he became a follower of Christ. Kind of yes, no, yes, no, yes. Are you with me on Peter? So he was the most adamant and impulsive and strong-willed guy. And yet he got influenced by the, one, by the folks who said, oh, well, you know, if you're really going to be a Christian, you've got to be a Jew first. And he was, he was going along with that. And so the Lord sent him a dream three times. Is that because he's a slow learner? Maybe. About, hey, what I've called clean, don't you be calling unclean. And Peter gets the message, and he goes with the people who call him, and he meets this man, Cornelius, who is a Gentile, a Roman. And what does God do? Peter meets Cornelius. Cornelius says, oh, you're a great man. And Peter says, no, 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 it's just, it's just Jesus. And they are having kind of a good time together, and then what happens? The Holy Spirit falls, bam, and all these people in Cornelius' household are hit with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and they're, uh, what does it say? It doesn't necessarily say, oh yeah, it does. It says, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God or lifting up God. And then Peter declared, well, yeah, can we withhold water from baptizing these people? They've received the Holy Spirit. So getting the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily mean you've got to be baptized first, apparently. It would be so much nicer if God were more consistent. Um, then we could make rules and, um, and stuff. But let's look at Acts chapter 8 as well. So Philip, who was not an apostle, uh, he was a guy who was chosen to be a, a deacon or a servant in the church. And it says, let's see, in chapter 8, Philip uh, goes to Samaria and he's uh, preaching and he's casting out evil spirits. And then look down here. At verse 12 in Acts chapter 8, where he says, But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And this is the story that we talk about. We call this guy Simon the sorcerer. Uh, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing signs and miracles performed, he was amazed. So people heard, they listened to the preaching, and they were baptized, men and women, which is significant because there was a time when, you know, only the head of household necessarily would have been baptized. I think th this is on purpose for us to show that it's for every person, every individual person. And to break down walls. Because we all did it. We all did it. Last one is Acts chapter 16. Paul and his companions. Looking at verse 13, And on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place to pray. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us 
was a woman named Lydia. from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. I like this story for several reasons. One, that she already kind of had an inkling about God. And it doesn't say, and Paul spoke so convincingly that she listened. No, it says the Lord opened her heart. So it's not about you and me being really good at speaking, thank God. It's asking the Lord to open people's hearts that they could receive and believe what he has to say. The other thing I like about this story is, so here's this lady who's like working, she's working down at the riverside and she hears these guys talking and she's moved by the Spirit. So she's baptized and her household and she kind of challenges them. She's a, she's a, a Gentile woman. Strike one, strike two. She says, look, if, if what you say is really true, if you believe what you've been telling me, then show me that you fully accept me as a person by coming to my house to eat. You see, in those days, the Jews, well, I should say all social classes, eating with someone was, that, was a sign that you, that you accepted them, that you were peers, that you were friends. And so for them to say, well, Jesus is awesome and you should love him, is one thing, but she says, look, if, if you judge me faithful, come to my house and stay with me. And so they did. Landon likes to talk about, um, I've heard him use this, this picture, uh, about baptism being like, like your wedding ring. It's like, well, I got married, and legally I'm married, and in my heart I'm married, but if, uh, if I say, you know, I'm, I'm too mature for these old-fashioned symbols, I, I don't need to wear that to show I'm married, so I'm just, gonna, I'm just not going to wear it. How would you feel, honey? <laughs> you know, I mean, what would it say about me if I said, you know, I just don't believe in that, you know, those are dumb, those old-fashioned notions. Well, it might say something about me if I, you know, does it mean I'm ashamed to be known as her husband or, or that I want ladies to think I'm available? I mean, I, who, I don't know. So I guess my point in, st in that story is baptism People sometimes, again, want to get into debates about, well, when do you actually get saved? And, and, and is baptism a necessity? It's kind of like the argument about, is there free will? Or, or, or is there um, sovereignty of God and, and, and predestination? And I would have to say, yes, there is. They're in there. Um, is baptism necessary for salvation? Uh, yes. Can you, be can you be saved and not been baptized? Yes. I don't believe it's a contradiction. And yet there's so many examples in the New Testament of this was part of fellowship, this was part of becoming the family, that it's just what, as, as the... Um, the guy in Acts chapter 8, I skipped it. It's also in Acts chapter 8. About Philip, he goes on and he sees this guy in a chariot, a foreigner and a eunuch. We all know what a eunuch is, right? Uh, he, he was a man with crushed testicles. He was not acceptable to enter into God's presence. And he was a foreigner who's not a Jew. 
And Philip says, let's go for a ride. Now, we know that the, that the eunuch was reading in Isaiah, and we know that he asks a question. Is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Oh my good Lord, I wish this sermon was on a, a, a podcast. Because it says, Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, told him the good news about Jesus. I want to know what he said. <laughs> because whatever he said, baptism must have been in there somewhere because the man says, look, here's some water. What, what's stopping me? What's stopping us from getting, from getting baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop and they went down in the water and he baptized him. So here's a guy who has no inkling of what it means to be a Jew, of, what, of who God is, and yet he says, well, if this is true, I want to do this right now. Uh, that's all I need. I, I want to do it. Um, and so it's just part of it, not as a legal demand, oh, if you don't do this, blah, blah, this is going to happen. No, but of a overwhelming flood of emotion and spiritual he loves me he loves me and I I want to be part of this family this team here it is here's some water what's stopping us I, I love it thank you so much Lord God for your overwhelming love of us, that you have immersed us in your love, that you have the metaphor of dying wool, that you have stained us, or uh, whatever the opposite of staining is, you have cleansed us with your blood to where that you, we are never going to be the same. We are never going to be the same that no amount of dirt and life and trouble is going to wash away what you have done because you have done it irrevocably. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love and forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to walk with you and love you and live in your love all of the rest of the days you give us until we are free of this earth to be with you. Thank you, Lord. I just ask, Lord, that you will bless each family here, each person here, that you will give us your healing, Lord, your love, that we're not just forgiven, Lord, but that we're filled with you and your spirit that good stuff will come out of us when we are squeezed by the world. Thank you, spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.